Today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to take a look at uh, our study in Christianity 101, and we're going to take a look at the second part of what we looked at last week. Last week, we talked about true Christianity, um, uh, true, or excuse me, true righteousness, and um, today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a little bit more of it as far as true righteousness. Now last week we looked at true righteousness as far as how righteousness comes from the heart. But today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at true righteousness as far as it is something that is uh, God-centered. You know, if you think about true righteousness, true righteousness at the core is going to be about pleasing God, right? I mean, that's what you think about righteousness. Righteousness is pleasing God. And so if you think about it, true righteousness really is going to be about that. And so if that is what it is about, um, then God is going to be at the center of it, right? Okay. But at the same time, when we think about self-righteousness, self-righteousness, God is not at the center of it. Instead, self is. You see, many times people will want to live or say they're going to live a righteous life, but whether they um, realize it or not, whether they're confused by it, whatever the reason for it, when they don't live a life of true righteousness and they fall into the trap of living a life of self-righteousness, then what we're going to see today is that ultimately it is about ourselves. And when it is about ourselves, oftentimes what we have to do is we have to kind of manipulate the Word of God in order to fit and to justify this thing of I'm trying to live righteously, but at the same time I'm living for myself. You can't live righteously and for yourself at the same time because, again, living righteously is pleasing God. And so therefore, you have to have God um, at the center of it. Okay, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, if you remember what we looked at, going back to verse number 20, is that Jesus told his disciples that unless their righteousness exceeded or surpassed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, they would not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that must have taken a lot of people aback because in that society, in their minds, in their eyes, nobody was going to be more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes were the ultra-religious ultra, uh, ultra people. They were the people that had it all together. They had the people who knew everything. They were the ones that were on a higher plane and ranked than everybody else. And so if they're saying, wait a minute, if, if our righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes, then how in the world are we even going to do that? But then Jesus starts to go down through the rest of chapter 5 and starts to give all of these examples about how the Jews of Jesus' day, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, were taking the Old Testament law of God and they were twisting it and distorting it in order for it to conform to their own purposes. And he was coming back in and resetting the law as far as what he wanted his disciples to do. All right, now let's take a look where we're going to pick up things in verse 31. In verse 31 it says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that whoever divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep your oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Do not uh, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. 
But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, before we start to get into all of these different examples, I want us to go back and I want us to talk a little bit more about what self-righteousness is and a few things about self-righteousness. Now, again, righteousness is the way that we stand before God. And so if we're going to be talking about self-righteousness, what we're really talking about is we are wanting to stand before God on the basis of what we do. What we do, or maybe in some cases, what we don't do is what, the way that we are going to be standing before God. And so here is God, the righteous judge. God is looking at us, and we're thinking, okay, we are going to be standing before God right there on what we do or we don't do. Now, this is self righteousness because the righteousness is coming from ourselves and as I said before if the righteousness is coming before ourselves then selfishness is going to be at the core of it but there's only one problem with that whole thing and that is we can't stand before God as righteous and the reason for that is that we ourselves as people we are not righteous. We are sinners by nature. Going all the way back to the very first days of Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, from that point forward, sin came into humanity. And, as what the scripture says, death by sin. And so, all will die because all have sinned before God. Now, when we look at it that way, we think, okay, well, how in the world are we going to stand before God? Well, okay, this is where Jesus comes in, isn't it? Jesus, as what he just told his disciples, didn't come to abolish the law and to do away with the law. Instead, Jesus came to fulfill the law. And so when we believe that Jesus Christ came, that he lived his life for us, and that he is our Savior, he delivers us, then we no longer stand before God as far as the basis of our own righteousness. We stand before God on the basis of being righteous before Him through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus told His disciples in John chapter 3, verse 17, that He didn't come into the world to judge the world, but He came into the world to save the world. And He said that whoever believes in Me is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only Son. And so you can see that if somebody wants to stand before God with self-righteous means, then they are going to be condemned because no matter how much good they are able to do or how much bad they are able to avoid, they cannot get around the unmistakable fact that they are sinners before God. The only way that we can stand before God is to be forgiven of our sins, and that forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ. And so here is this true righteousness that we see. So here we are back at self-righteousness, right? If we are trying to live a life of self-righteousness, then all of a sudden what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a look at God's Word, which shows us what true righteousness holy is, and we're saying, no, okay, we've got to be righteous in ourselves. And so how, since we can't match up to what that is, how can we change that to reflect ourselves? And that's exactly what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing. And that's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that, then you won't get into the kingdom of heaven. Now we see this, as a matter of fact, if you look at these different examples, you've noticed that in each example that we just read, in verse 31, for example, it says, it has been said. In other words, here is the law that God gave, here is the distortion that kind of came through years of tradition, and what was commonly told to people, what people commonly felt about it. But Jesus comes back, in verse 32, for example, he says, but I tell you, he's coming back, 
and he's resetting that purpose. And you see that in verse 31, verse 32. And if you go on down to, to verse 33 and verse, verse 34, you see the same thing. In verse 33, he says, again, you have heard that it was said. But in verse 34, he says, but I tell you, here's what you've heard about the, sub the subject. This is what you think you know, but Jesus, as the Son of God, as the Messiah, is saying, this is what I'm telling you. This is what you need to do. And then again, in verse 38, you have heard that it was said, but in verse 39, he says, but I tell you. And in verse 43, he says, you have heard that it was said. And then in verse 44, he comes back and says, but I tell you. Do you see how Jesus is going back and he's resetting that original intent that has been distorted time and time again. You see, one thing that we need to understand is that when we try to live a self-righteous life, then what we're really going to do is, you know, there's some people that are going to try to live a self-righteous life and then realize and see their sin sooner or later, and they're just going to give up, right? I can't do it. But other people are going to live this self-righteous life, and they're going to try to twist and distort and say, well, yeah, that, that really is a sin in that kind of situation, but in my case, it's not. Well, you know, sin is what sin is, and righteousness is what it is. And we need to realize that when we're living a true, righteous, truly righteous life, that first of all, it's going to be coming by the grace of God. And when it comes by the grace of God and we're a child of God, then all of a sudden our world shifts to where God is the center of it, and then the true righteousness of what can we do to please God comes in. But when we're trying to live a self righteous life, then self is at the center, and all of the things that we are doing is revolving around that self, and so we have to go and try to change and adjust things to where we can still keep on that self-centered lifestyle, but at the same time try to twist and distort God's Word. That's not going to work on the Day of Judgment. <laughs> the Lord's not going to say, well, okay, I gave you the law, this is what I wanted you to do, but this is the way you changed it, and I'm going to accept it. No, it doesn't work that way. The only way it's going to work is to say we're a sinner, and we have righteousness in God, or righteousness in Jesus Christ. All right, now let's take a look at some of these examples that Jesus said. Now we look at verse 31, verse 32, we see the example of divorce. And in verse 31, you see what the Pharisees had said about divorce. Verse 31, it says, it has been said, Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Now, that actually came back uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24. And in that passage in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, um, the, God gave the Israelites the instruction that if a man marries a woman and there is some sort of impurity in her life that would make the marriage impossible, that he was supposed to give her a, a certificate of divorcement and where she would go off. And if she then went and married somebody else, and then that person divorced her, the first man was not to go back and remarry her. Okay? Now, that was what the law meant. But, when you think about, okay, there's some sort of impurity in someone's life, that's one thing that the Pharisees started to uh, center upon. They were thinking, okay, well, what is the definition of impurity? Right? Okay, and so they started to look at impurity as far as any number of things. All right, well, she's got this. Well, she doesn't. Do, she really doesn't keep a good house. She really doesn't cook very well. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. And so, therefore, and this is where the second thing that they came in, they would say it's in the law that I can give her a certificate of divorce. I am. I have this God-given right to divorce her. Now, that's the way that they looked at it that back then. But that was not what God's original intent was. And that's why Jesus comes up in verse 32 to say, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. And so Jesus is going back to that original intent where back in the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and God created Eve from Adam's flesh, that he brought the two of them together and they were to be one's flesh. Now Jesus, later on in the book of Matthew chapter 19, 
Jesus had more controversy with all of this with the Jews because they wanted to test him and get him to, to define that idea about what constitutes um, uncleanliness in her. And Jesus just simply said, this isn't the way that it was from the beginning. The way it was from the beginning was that two people were to come together and what God's joined together, let man not put asunder. It's kind of ironic that, you know, here we just had the, uh, <laughs> the wedding shower yesterday and, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about marriage this morning. I didn't plan it that way. I promise you. It just worked out, okay? I promise. I promise. But one thing that we need to understand, and I, I understand that, you know, with marriage and divorce, it, it is complicated. And furthermore, I want to say that there are people who are divorced that can live and do live very good, godly Christian lives that I love, admire, and respect. Okay? So, I don't want you to think about the things that I'm about to say as far as to say, oh, well, he is... No, no, no. I, I, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this. That when you talk about divorce, if you think about what divorce is, that there is selfishness that is there. Okay, on one party or, not, or the other, or both, but there is selfish, selfishness that is there. And you say, well, wait a minute, how can you say something like that? Because of this, if you think about it, what marriage cannot succeed if God is at the center of both people? If God is at the center of both people, then both people realize and understand that the marriage is bigger than themselves. That the marriage is not about them. It's not about what they can get. It's not about what they feel. It's not about anything else. But instead, marriage is about something that is really kind of a sacred thing before God. And that what God has brought together, man shouldn't divide. Man shouldn't separate. Man shouldn't put asunder. That's what it says in the King James. And so when we realize, when people realize, hey, wait a minute, you know, this is something bigger, and if God is at the center of my life, then I need to do whatever I can to work things out. Now, again, it takes two for that to work, right? You know, if there is one person of the party that's trying to do that, and the other person where it is, you know, all about me and selfishness, then it probably isn't going to happen or it's going to really be difficult. But with two people doing it, there is no reason why it shouldn't work out. Now, today, if, if you know, this situation, if you're watching this on Facebook and you're thinking about, you know, should I be divorced, should I not be divorced? I, I just humbly ask you to just stop and think and say, you know, what does God think about this? How does God see this? Am I going to be pleasing God or I'm not going to be pleasing God? And then humbly ask God to help you work things out and to give you the strength and the wisdom to work out. Now again, it takes two, right? You know, I'm not going to say that everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be wonderful, that everything's going to be work out. But if both people would have that attitude and let God be first, then there really is not any sort of problem that can't be overcome. Now, moving on to the next one, and that is the example of vows. And no, we're not talking about wedding vows. We're talking about oaths, even though that's kind of very similar. In verse uh, 33, it says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep your oaths you have made to the Lord. Now, we don't really have the same kind of, of view on oaths today as what they had back then. Back then, um, an oath that you took was a legally binding contract. It was something that would be very similar to our contracts today. You know, when you go and you, you have an agreement with somebody and you put your name on dotted line and you sign a legally binding contract, you are obligating yourself to something. That's the way that they, they very similarly viewed oaths. And that is that they would make an oath, they would swear by something, and that was supposed to obligate you. Now, if you were to go and if you were to make an oath and you were to involve the Lord, then that was going to be something very serious because 
if you made an oath and you involved the Lord in it, you were really saying, I am going to fulfill the duties of my obligation, whatever that obligation is, um, so help me God, and if I don't, then God is going to get on my case. Okay, that's really what you're saying. And so the, the Jews would just simply say, okay, um, you, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, don't break your oath, but keep your oath you have made to the Lord. Well, wait a minute, what about the oath you didn't make to the Lord? Can you break those? As a matter of fact, if you're going to go that route, then can you make an oath that would be associated with the Lord, but not to the Lord? And would that be of any lesser value than the note that you made to the Lord? Okay? And so if you go and if you swear by the Lord, oh, you got to keep that. But if you go and you swear by something associated with the Lord, well, you know, maybe there's some wiggle room if you can't do it. So if you go and if you swear um, by the heaven, well, that's very much associated with the Lord, right? And so you're going to be obligated to that legally. But if you swear by the earth, well, everybody knows that you're kind of serious about that, but not really serious. Okay? And at the same time, they felt like if you swore and made an oath toward Jerusalem, that you were involving God, but if you swore by Jerusalem, you were not. And they had a whole complicated series of what constituted oaths in certain pecking orders. Does that make any sense? Do you see how there's a lot of little loopholes there, a lot of legalities, much like our contracts today. You know, one reason why it is so complicated to get anything done is because there's all kinds of people out there who are trying to find loopholes in things. So what does Jesus say? Well, Jesus just simply said this. He said, but I tell you in verse 34, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, because you cannot make even one hair, white or black. You can't change anything about that. You don't have any power over that. So what makes you think that you can swear by it? Instead, he just simply says in verse 37, simply may let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. In other words, tell the truth. Be truthful in what you say, and what you say, do it. Back it up. That was the original intent of the law. Now think about it this. Why do we lie? Or why do we tell somebody that we're going to do something and then back out of it? You know, mostly it has to do with self, right? We're going to lie because we're either going to cover up something about ourselves or we're going to lie because we want to try to get something from someone else, right? That's, I, mean, I know that there's other reasons why people lie, but if you think about it, that is really a lot of it right there. Try to cover up something of ourselves so people don't know about it or to try to get something from someone else. And if you also think about it, why do we tell the truth? Why should we tell the truth? Even when it's times that we are going to lose something of ourselves or we're going to lose something of value. Well, for Christians, it should just simply be because that's what God wants. God is of truth, right? God is truth himself. Jesus Christ, when he was talking to Pilate, and Pilate said, what is truth? He didn't realize he was looking at the embodiment of truth. And so if we're going to be children of God, followers of God, then don't you see why it is necessary for us to live by truth? To just simply say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So if somebody comes up and they ask you something, you tell them something, a Christian should be good at their word, right? And so if somebody says, yeah, that person told me this and I believe it, or that person told me that and I, I don't, you know, that should be the case. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to be right about everything. You know, we can be mistaken about something. There's a difference between lying and being mistaken about something. But when we say, yeah, this is, this is what I did, this is, and we, you know, especially if we say, I'm telling you the truth, let's make sure that that's exactly what it is. It's the truth. Let's not try to, to manipulate and do things. And especially in our dealings with other people, I understand, you know, sometimes we promise something. We say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll do something for you. And then all of a sudden something comes up and you can't. 
And you have to call them up and say, hey, listen, I'm sorry, I, I want to, I just can't. But you know, when we tell somebody that we are going to do something, let's do it. Don't tell somebody something and then go around and say, well, you know, I really don't want to do it, so I, I'm, I'm just going to make something up later on to get off the hook. That's not what a Christian should be. That's not what a Christian should do. A Christian, because we have been saved by truth, we should be about truth. Here's another example. And I didn't know what to call the example other than what was just simply the, uh, the, the subtitle in um, the NIV. And that is, an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. So here's the example of an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. You notice that in verse 38, it says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What this originally was in the Old Testament was just simply akin to what we say as far as the punishment needs to fix the crime. This had something to do with a judicial sense. If someone committed a crime, then the punishment for the crime needed to match the crime. And so if somebody lost an eye, so to speak, then it's going to be something the punishment has to be akin to it, equivalent to it. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's not right. It's not just to take a minor infraction and over-punish someone for it. And it's also not right to take somebody who's done something wrong and not punish them or not punish them severely for it. And so basically, it's just simply the punishment has to meet the crime. But the Jews were taking it in terms of out of a, a judicial sphere and into an individual sphere. And so if you do something for, to me, then I have the God-given right to do something back to you. That's how they took it. If you hurt me, then I've got the God-given right to hurt you back. If you insult me, I've got the God-given right to insult you. If you cheat and steal from me, then I've got the God-given right to cheat and steal back from you. And so this is how Jesus reset the law. He said, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You know, striking somebody in the cheek would be an insult. And if you think about it, striking somebody on the right cheek, either you have to be behind them, which doesn't really work that well. You're probably going to be in front of them. And if you're going to be in front of them, except for left-handed people, <laughs> which we got a lot of, by the way, um, except for left-handed people, you're going to be hitting them with the back of the hand, which in that culture was a double insult. And so Jesus is saying, if someone comes up and gives you a backhand to the cheek, which will be an extreme insult, offer the other also. Don't retaliate. You don't have the God-given right of retaliation. And what's more, he says, that if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. You know, somebody's cloak in the Old Testament law was not supposed to be taken from them. You know, you could sue somebody, you could take something from somebody, but they were not supposed to take the cloak. So if somebody comes up and takes the tunic, then, you know, and, and wants the cloak, give them the cloak as well. Furthermore, he says, if somebody forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. In that day and time, Roman soldiers could come up and force somebody to carry their equipment to the next mile marker. And so if you're walking down the road and here comes a Roman soldier, if you're going that way and he's going this way, he can come up and say, hey, you, carry my stuff to the next mile marker. Okay? Well, you're in luck if the next mile marker is just, you know, a couple of hundred yards that way, right? But what it would be and what would it be like if you were to say and carry the stuff from one mile marker and say, you know what, I'm going to go with you the next one. Maybe you have a chance to witness to that person, right? Yeah, it's going to be out of your way. It's going to take you further out of your way. But do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying is that you don't have the God-given right to retaliation. If you think about it, retaliation is really based on our pride. It's based on our strength. It's based on our power. It's based on our anger. It is somebody's doing something to us and it hurts our pride. It makes us mad. I want to show how strong I am. I want to show that I can fight back. I want to do all these things. And so because of that, I'm going to do it. 
Well, you can do it, but please understand that God is not wanting you to do it. You don't have the God-given right to do those things. You know, there's a lot of injustices on this earth. What happens when we run into injustice? Do we take matters into our own hands? Or do we just simply say, God is the ultimate judge, and God can take care of things far better than we can? Do you see how for disciples of Jesus to put all of this judgment in God's hands is the way to go? Now that's not to say that if somebody does something to us that we can't seek civil authorities because after all, the civil authorities that we have in the world today, God has left those things in place for us to have those avenues. That's the way it was in the Old Testament. That's the way it was in the New Testament. That's the way it is now. And so if somebody does something to us, we do have civil means to try to have recourse. But at the same time, we need to understand that our government, whether it's local, state, federal, whatever, is going to fail because it's imperfect. And when that happens, what do we do? The Christian thing to do would be to say, God's above it all, and God can take care of it. And that may mean that we may have to endure insults. It may mean that we have to endure injustices. It may mean that we have all these things. But that's the way it is if we're going to serve God. Now, the last example and that is the example of loving our enemies. In verse 34, uh, 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You know, in the Old Testament, it says, Love your neighbor. Okay? But the Jews kind of said, Okay, well, you can love your neighbor, but what about all the people that are enemies to you? Um, it wasn't necessarily in rabbinical literature, but it was probably kind of a, a common thought, a common saying, Yeah, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Jesus says, no, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you and that you'll be called sons of your Father in heaven. Notice this. Jesus says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now think about this. God takes care of all people on the earth, doesn't he? God sends sun to everybody. God sends rain to everybody which is not a curse, that's a blessing. If we didn't have rain, where would we be with crops, right? Okay, so God does this. God allows people to continue. What happens about the people who blaspheme God? What about the people that curse God? The people that shake their fists and say, I hate you, God. What about the people who deny God and say, you don't exist? Guess what? God still has allowed them to breathe, God still allow, allows the laws of gravity to hold them to the planet. God still allows um, sunshine and rain to affect them the same that he does everybody else. Do you see how God is gracious to all? And if we're going to be sons of God, then that's the way that we should be as well too. That we should be gracious to people, loving to people, to those that love us, <coughs> excuse me, but also to the ones that don't love us, to those who are persecuting us, to those who are insulting us, to those who are doing all sorts of falsehood against us. And you say, well, wait a minute, I don't want that to happen. But you remember back in the Beatitudes, Jesus said that when those things happen, blessed are you because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Right? As a matter of fact, you notice that as he continues in verse 46, he starts to give the opposite of a God-centered view of things to a self-centered view of things. He says, if you love those that love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, are you doing more than others? Do not the, even the pagans do that? You know, if you think about it, if you are just friendly and if you are just loving to the people that love you, what good are you doing? I mean, if you think about it, even Adolf Hitler probably had his friends, right? Saddam Hussein probably 
there were people on this earth that liked him and he liked them. You're not doing anything out of the ordinary. You're not doing anything special if that's the only way that you do. Instead, what you're doing is you're just operating like people do. And people will tend to like and be loving to those people who will do the same back to them because that is reciprocating. Why do I love this person? Why do I like them? Why do I do something for them? It's because I'm going to get something back in return. But there's no reward from our Father in Heaven. Instead, the reward from our Father in Heaven comes when we do something for someone and we don't get anything back. We're trying to love someone knowing that they're not going to love us back. That instead, they're going to speak evil against us, they're going to run us down, they're going to persecute us, but we're still going to be loving anyway. Why? Because that's the way God is. And if we're Christians, that's who we are. We're sons of God. Do you see how, as Christians, at the core of living righteously, we should live God-centered lives? And to live a God-centered life, first of all, you have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus said that nobody comes to the Father except through me. He said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. And so if you want to have God as the center of your life, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior in order to know God. Once you, once you have that forgiveness of God, and once you have that peace of God in your life, then all of a sudden God can be the center of your life. Now, does that mean that we're going to do everything perfectly? As a matter of fact, you may be looking at these examples, all of these examples in chapter 5, and you may be thinking, wow, this is pretty tough. I don't know if I can do this. Well, okay, you don't have to do these things perfectly in order to get into heaven. You have to accept Jesus to get into heaven. All right? That's what the Pharisees and the scribes were not doing because they're self-righteousness. But after having that forgiveness, if we really want to be true, if we want to be genuine, if we want to be non-hypocritical, then this is what we have to be. And to be it, we have to have God at the center of our lives, not ourselves. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for your blessings, and thank you for this time that we've had together. Lord, I ask that you would please help us to um, understand these things, help us to put these things into practice. Lord, I know that many times these things are difficult because at our core we're selfish. But Lord, I ask that with your grace and your mercy that you would help us to um, put you first and to make you the center of our worlds. Lord, please forgive us of our sins and be it those who are lost. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.